Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2024 Fearless Summit. Next on stage, he is the founder of Fearless Summit and the senior pastor of Mobono Church, a movement of over 50 urban congregations spread across 10 different nations. He is a best-selling author of numerous books, including Financial Fitness, Seasons, Mizizi, and many more. An internationally renowned conference speaker, he is also an influential thought leader who mentors many younger leaders who are seeking to bring positive change to their cities and nations across the African continent and beyond. Please help me welcome to the stage Moravi Wanjao. Thank you. Wow. Amen. I think you thought you need to know a bit more about me. Now you know who I am. Now, can we give a big shout to Jesus right now? Come on, just give a big lift up his name. We worship you, Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Father, we we want to bless you. We want to say that Jesus is lifted up in this place. Father God, we thank you because this is your habitation. Three days, the next four days, we know that Lord, in your, your word has said where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there with them. And so Lord, we embrace your presence. You're here already. And Lord, we declare that no weapon that is fashioned against this place shall prosper. We declare that every word that is spoken against us shall be stilled. We declare that any agents of work right now, your work is nullified in Jesus' name. Paralysis upon all the forces of Satan. We declare that all depression, all oppression is canceled right now in Jesus' name. Do I need another mic to declare? Satan, we have much technology in this house. We declare a spirit of joy. We declare, Lord, that there will be healing in this house. This morning in our prayer time, several people were healed. So already God is beginning to work. And Father God, I just pray right now, raise up our expectation. We're not here just in a conference. We're here on the mountain of the Lord to experience the power of the Lord. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would connect with our spirits. Ah, we cannot have come all this way. We cannot have taken all this time away just to come and be entertained. We are here to meet you, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that today there will be an encounter. Don't even wait till Saturday. Start today, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, people's lives are going to be turned upside down. Speak to us, Lord. Help us to understand what we are here for. Lord, our world needs you right now. And we need you right now. And so, Lord, we invite you and we say, come and have your way. This is your space. Lord, we're not even on an agenda. We're here on your time. So come and have your way. For we pray these things in the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. God's people say, amen, amen and amen. Amen. Please have your seats. Wow, wow, wow. Somebody say, wow. <laughs> It's a good day. It's a good day. What a great joy to welcome all of you to Fearless 2024. And it's such a joy to see people who've come from all over the place. Let me tell you, I've never seen a Fearless that has been as opposed as this one. And I told people this morning, for me, when I see opposition, I'm always very excited. Because I've come to believe that my opposition is a sign of my strong position. I don't know what God has for you this weekend, but I tell you, it's going to be amazing. I think I've had, I've had conversations with almost 10 of our speakers who found great opposition coming here. This morning in prayer, we are praying because one of our speakers was stuck in an airport. He went to board his plane. He wasn't even allowed to board. And we prayed. And I want to let you guys know the visa came through on his way. So tomorrow morning, our Prashan will be landing from Sri Lanka and we give thanks to God. So I just want to encourage you, just keep praying, keep holding it up because there's something powerful that God wants to do. I believe there's going to be an outpouring of His Holy Spirit this weekend uh, in a way that we've not encountered Him before. My name is Moredi Wanjao, as you've heard. I'm the senior pastor of the Mavuno Movement of Churches. And it's my singular joy to welcome all of you. Thank you for making it, especially for those of you who've come from other nations. 
uh, you are fearless. Yeah. Because your media told you not to come. They told you this is not a safe place to be. But who are you to be afraid of unsafe places? You are here. You knew that God had something for you in this place. And you came anyway. Can we just appreciate all those from other nations who are here despite everything they've had to tell them the contrary. And I just want to tell you that because you're here, we believe that the blessing of God is upon this nation as well. Uh, we have some troubles in this country, just like there are troubles across the world. But I believe that God is about to do a new thing as he equips his people to be the hope of the world that so needs them right now. Amen. Our, our, our theme this year, the theme of fearless is unshakable. Unshakable. Unshakable faith in a volatile world. And you've heard our theme verse. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it says, therefore, I like that word, therefore. Therefore, because the world is shaking around you, because things are difficult around you, because there are economic turmoil, there's things all around you that will make you shake. The word of God says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, come on, say it with me if you know it. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. And I believe that God wants to raise up unshakable churches in this season, in these days that we live in. How many know that we are living in the last days? Yeah. You know, it's very interesting because the signs are all around us. The signs are Jesus prophesied are all around us. We saw that as we began. Plagues, pandemics, climate change, natural calamities, wars and rumors of war. In addition, we're going through, we're, we're living right now in a generation where there is so much hostility towards the Christian faith. How many people have sensed that? There's just a hostility in our media. There's a hostility in our cultures against the Christian faith. And there are many reasons why this is so. Number one are external factors. There are many external factors. You know, the enemy does not want the name of Jesus to be proclaimed. There is a spirit of the Antichrist that is prevalent in the world we live in. You're going to find that the world is rapidly embracing values that are at odds with the faith that the Lord left us. Things to do with sexuality, things to do with gender, things to do with marriage, things to do with the definition of what it means to be a human being. That the world is embracing values that are at odds with our faith. In addition, there's just a secular agenda to paint church a certain way. I mean, it's amazing. There's just this, that you can tell it in the press. Whenever there's something that happens against Christianity, they jump onto it like, my goodness. It's like they've discovered it, and they want the whole world to know how horrible the church of Jesus is. And you know, I used to see this many years in the West. When I lived in the West, I used to think, my goodness, this is so hostile against Christianity. I didn't know I'd see it in my time, in such a short time, happening in our own nation as well and in our own part of the world as well. So there are external factors, but there are also internal factors. And some of those internal factors are, what, are things like church leadership scandals that have, I don't know, I, I just i am shocked at how many leaders, men and women of God, have done things that are scandalous, that have brought shame to the gospel. They have a lot to do with the unholy trinity of money, sex, and power. And I believe that the devil has unleashed a great attack upon men and women of God. And this has brought so many things. I mean, so many prominent men and women of God have just fallen in scandal after scandal. And un unfortunately, in their eyes, in the eyes of the popular culture, they end up representing what Christianity is. So we have external factors, but we also have internal factors. And as a result, many of you especially those who are from the younger generation, when you say you're a Christian, people look at you and they say, somebody's got to be crazy. Like, like, why would you choose to be a Christian? Why would, you, why would you do this? This is what they look at you and they wonder, why? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, that's what they're thinking when they see you, when they see you proclaiming, when they see you putting on your Instagram your verse of the day. They're thinking, are you crazy? Because these are the things that they see that have painted the church a certain way. And let me just say this, the next generation is fed up with what they think of as the hypocrisy they're seeing in the churches. 
Are we are living in a time when being a Christian is not a cool thing. I remember when my, I believe when my parents, well, their, their Christianity, it was a cool thing to be a Christian. But in our generation, it's not a cool thing to be a Christian. And let me just say that the enemy of the church has gleefully fueled that fire. He's gleefully fueling. So that even Christians today are ashamed to be Christians. What a shock. Yeah, you're going to find Christians who even are talking about the church. I, 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 some Christians have actually made it their prominent journey to, to out the church. To, 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 to ashamed the church. To call out the church. And I think in, in some way they feel like they're doing good. And they don't realize they've become like what they call an autoimmune disease. You know what an autoimmune disease is? Is when the cells of your body start fighting itself. And there are many Christians who feel like that's their journey, that, that their role is to become uh, outers of the church. But they don't understand that they are participating in the agenda of the enemy. And the question we must be asking is, how can we build a resilient faith that is unshakable in the light of the volatility of the world we live in? And that's why the title of this fearless is unshakable. My prayer is, by the way, God's people, that your being here for the next three days is going to root your faith and help you be unshakable. That every congregation here is going to become unshakable in the times to come. Because I believe God is raising a remnant. God is raising a church that would stand up in these last days and be a witness to Him, reach the next generation uh, for His glory. The title of my message is Becoming Unshakable. How rediscovering Jesus' genius methods is the key to the gospel thriving in our generation. It's a long, long title. You know, Jesus has some genius methods. And sometimes we think we're very clever. But I've come to understand that, my goodness, 2,000 years ago, the things he taught us were genius. There are some smart things that if we could just understand and go back to them as a church, we will find that we're able to be unshakable in a shaking world. It's interesting because there's, there's one of the questions that people would ask you, what's the purpose of a Christian? Why are we here on earth? Maybe you can help me tell your neighbor, what, 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 what's, what's our mission? Why are we here? Tell your neighbor why you think we're here. What are Christians here on earth to do? What's the purpose? Why aren't you in heaven today? Since you're already saved. What's your purpose while you're here on earth? Why are we here? I'm sure you have great answers. How many people say it, the Great Commission? Yeah? The kingdom of God. Expanding the kingdom. If you didn't say that, you, you give the wrong answer. <laughs> You're only here for one reason. By the way, you should be, right now, you are as saved as you will ever be. There's nothing in you that disqualifies you from being before the throne of God. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you are saved. You will never be more loved by God than you are right now. There's nothing. The only reason you're here on earth is to be fruitful and make disciples. And Jesus left his disciples with that instruction. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And he says, Then Jesus, let's read it together. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven... And on earth has been given to me. There's that word again. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is called our mission brief. As a Christian... This is your mission. Your mission, should you accept it, is exactly what Jesus put. Let, just put the next slide because it shows you a little bit about that mission. We break it down a bit. And this is your mission brief. Dun, 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 Your mission, should you accept it, your assignment is to make disciples. This is... Bringing people who are far from God into the kingdom. Making them followers of Jesus. That's why you're here on earth. Tell your neighbor, that's why you're here. Yeah, you're not here to make money. <laughs> you know, we spend a lot of time making money. 
Do you understand that the kingdom you are created for, the, the streets are lined with gold? Some of you, you're spending your time filling your pockets with tarmac. With... <laughs> I tell you, it's like you're, you're feeling, like the stuff that's going to be on the streets, that's what you're spending your life, that's not what you're here for. Your assignment is what? To make disciples. Next thing in your brief, it gives you the scope. This is heaven's mission for you. That it is to reach all nations. The Greek word is ta ethne. And ethne means not just political countries. It means every people group on this planet. In, in other words, within that nation, there are people groups. God is granular. He wants you to go even deeper than just the country. He wants you to reach every people group needs to be reached with the gospel. That's the scope of our mission. And then number, th and, and, and you need to understand that our mission is global. None of you was created to be local. Yeah. Your impact cannot just be your village. You're created for a lot more than just the little space around you. It's Judea, it's Samaria, it's to all the way to the utmost parts of the earth. This is what you're created for. The next part of our brief is our strategy. It tells you a two-part strategy. It tells you, number one, baptize. When you baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it means you're helping them make a profession of faith and come into the kingdom of God. They were in the kingdom of darkness and you're giving birth to sons and daughters of the light. That's what it means to baptize them. And then number two, teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. I'm going to talk about that a bit. Because one of the things that many people who call themselves Christians don't like to do is to obey. Uh, it's a very, very interesting thing that this is the second part. We sometimes focus on the first part, but we forget the second part. Teach them to obey. And then number four in our brief is our resource. It tells you you're equipped because every mission you have to be told. You know in the James Bond movie, they have to go into that room and they show you the new car and they show you the new gun and they show you that pen which can you press and something comes out. So what's your resource? He says, I. You don't need anything else. You have me. And when you have Jesus, you have everything. And what he's saying is you already have every resource to do everything that God put you on earth to do. Some of you are waiting to grow older then you can really serve God. Or you're waiting to have more money so you can serve God. Uh-uh, you already have it. Tell your neighbor you already have it. Everything you need to serve God, you already have it. Because you have Jesus with you. And that's all you need. Amen? Now, this is such a base... By the way, that's not my message. <laughs> this, this is just something that every Christian should know. Sadly, we don't all know it. And I didn't know it, by the way, for a long time. I thought I really understood this. And my confession is I was even teaching many people how to do what I thought I understood. So let me give you my story. Can I tell you my story? This, <laughs> this, is, this is a confession part. I just want to start. I want to give a confession at this point. Let me tell you my story. Put up my story because I put a slide on it. Uh, this is my public confession. Mavuno Church started in 2015 uh, and with a real passion to focus on the unchurched. You know, God wants us to reach those who are far from him, isn't it? We cannot start churches like, like, like Naivas or Tuskies. You know what happens when those big supermarket comes into your village? All the other small shops close. Many times we start Naivas churches. My job is to start the church that is bigger than all the other small ones, so I close them down and bring my mem their members in. That's not God's plan. He wants us to reach the unchurched. And so we began with that focus, to reach the unchurched. And God blessed us, because I believe, by the way, anybody who reaches the unchurched will be blessed. I'm completely convinced about that. And because of that, God blessed us with growth in size and influence. We became known as the Discipleship Church. And... We had a curriculum, and we have curricula that is used globally by churches across the world. And that was something that we were really excited about. I was invited to speak in conferences across the world and to teach about this. But deep inside, someone say deep inside, I had a sense of holy dissatisfaction. Have you ever felt in your heart there must be more? Yeah, this isn't all there is. There must be more. 
and I had a sense of holy dissatisfaction. I remember at the height when our church was the, the rocking church in the city. Everybody was talking about us. We had a light. I mean, people leaving the church would take an hour because there were so many people leaving the church. I would be out there greeting them and take an hour to empty one service. And in my heart of hearts, I was smiling at people, but my heart of hearts was like, Jesus, there must be more. You paid for more. There must be, but there should be more. This is not what I read about in the book of Acts. And you know, it's interesting because God used a crisis. And you know what the crisis was? Bringing Mavuno Church to this place. It almost broke me. Almost broke our church. And all those great disciples that I thought I had, I realized, oh my God. Okay, don't say that. Because some of them are here. I just realized we were not who I thought we were. I was not who I thought we were. And I was shocked. And God used that to teach me a very powerful lesson. And this is a, the lesson God taught me. Curriculum doesn't disciple people. People disciple people. Yeah. And, and, and I want to say this because there are many churches that are using great curriculum. You have a great course. You have great something. And maybe, some, maybe you're even using courses that we use because we still use curriculum, by the way. There's nothing wrong with great curriculum. And we have great curriculum here. But curriculum doesn't disciple people. People disciple people. That was a turning point for me, awake, an awakening moment for me as a leader. And because that was not happening, we were not set up to make disciples of all nations. It was such a shock for me. What a shock. I realized, I woke up one day and I said, I'm doing everything, but I cannot do the one thing I'm supposed to do, which is make disciples of the nations. And by the way, we already had church plants in I think six countries at that time. So we were a successful church. But I realized we were not set up to make disciples of all nations with the way we were set up. And that's when I noticed a very interesting thing. I became a student of, of, of churches. I started looking at what churches are doing this. And I noticed that the churches that were actually making disciples of all nations were very different in setup from our church. That these churches were what have been called globally as disciple-making movements disciple making movements for some of you that's the first time you're hearing that phrase but I want you to keep it in mind because I believe you're going to be hearing a lot more of it as the church wakes up to this fact disciple making movements and as I began to discover these movements by the way, one of the people who helped me discover them is Pastor Christian from uh, Mariners Church uh, I really love this brother uh, I think he decided to help me become global so he used to tell me pastor I'm going somewhere take let me take you with by the way, you stopped taking me places. What happened, Pastor Christian? Uh, you need to take me places. But you know, it was interesting. Wherever you took me, we found a movement. And I would ask questions. We went to Brazil with you. I mean, we went to China. We went to places with you. And every place I went, I would ask questions. And I'd realize these guys are set up very differently from how we're set up. And God began to speak to me about the difference between a regular church and a disciple-making movement. So let me give you a few differences. If you can put up that chart. This is where I found the global disciple-making movements. They're in Guatemala. They're in Brazil. They're in, in Ghana. They're in Nigeria. They're in India. They're South Korea. They're Philippines. They're in different places of the world. They're in Rongai. <laughs> but you know, it was interesting because I realized we don't have movements, global movements coming out of my nation or out of East Africa. And I was shocked by that. I was wondering what's wrong with us. Why don't we have those movements? I went to the U.S. where I used to go a lot to learn about the church. And I realized there are not many movements there. There's maybe one or two. And in the U.K., there's maybe one that I know of. Pastor Lincoln can correct me. Pastor Lincoln, who's from the U.K. This is one of my favorite. By the way, he's going to be speaking after me. And you guys are in for a treat. And, and, and he's, I mean, he, he, he I mean, he's in his nation, I think I know one movement. And I don't know many. And then the rest of Europe, there are not very many. But there are some parts of the world where there are movements everywhere. Yeah. Let me tell you, some of these nations I've mentioned here, you just find, go down the street, and you just find movement, 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 global movement everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Someone's awake in this church. <laughs> so, so I was asking myself, what's wrong? What's the difference? And that led me to this chart that I'm going to follow with you. Uh, regular churches versus disciple making movements. Regular churches versus disciple making movements. Here's some of the differences. Number one, regular churches, they deploy pastors to the front line of kingdom expansion. Yeah, pastors, they've got some serious pastors. 
and they raise up these pastors, they take them to school, they are happy with their pastors, they equip them heavily. Disciple making movements, they deploy the entire congregation to the front line of kingdom expansion. If you're in a movement, you're a pastor. How many pastors in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see, I, I can see you're, you're, you're getting there. You're getting the idea. Everyone in the kingdom is a pastor. Everyone has the ability to go and plant churches. Look at the book of Acts. Wherever they went in their persecution, they started new churches. That's how movements think. Regular churches are expensive. They need trained personnel. They need budgets. They need buildings. They can't multiply without a huge budget. Let me tell you, disciple-making movements are inexpensive because they rely on their pastor's resources, which means everybody's resources. And they have homes and networks and workplaces. They use all those places. Your office is where we're going to multiply. Your church house is where we're going to multiply. They plant churches everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's how disciple-making movements work. I want you to assess whether your church is a disciple movement, making movement. Uh, regular churches have a centralized vision and execution. Everything has to pass through a certain place for it to be done. But for disciple making movements, the vision may be centralized. They might have the same vision, but the execution happens with everybody in the church. Everybody is allowed to innovate that vision and to go out and to make disciples. And it's not, I mean, in fact, what happens many times the center is being informed. They're being told. I remember one, one of the very few uh, um, U.S. Uh, movements. It's called uh, Hope Chapel. How many of you have heard, heard of Hope Chapel? Yeah, like four of you. Yeah, Ralph Moore. By the way, movements are not loud. They don't make a lot of noise. They just take over the world. <laughs> and, and this guy, he's, he's the most humble guy you've ever met. I love this guy because he's not inspiring. And most movement leaders, by the way, are not inspiring. They're, they're not the best speakers. And maybe that's why they're able to trust the Holy Spirit because they don't trust themselves, huh? And, and this guy, he's such a humble guy. I was listening to him. By the way, even as you're listening to him, he's not very inspiring. So I, I, my mind had even drifted. Until he said something and I was like, what a minute. Wait, hold on, Instagram. Just hold on a minute. What did he say? And they asked him, how many churches do you have right now? And he said, 2,000. And then somebody in the room said, ah, Ralph, we're actually 20, uh, 25. And he said, ah, when were the 25 planted uh, last week? Oh, okay, 2,025. <laughs> I was like, what? He doesn't even know. The center is not even aware. It's like the thing is spreading from the periphery and every part is expanding. Uh, growth in regular churches is through addition, but in disciple-making movements is through multiplication because every factor is a multiplying factor. People, individuals are multiplying. Small groups are multiplying. Leaders are multiplying. Churches are multiplying. Everyone is a multiplying factor. Regular churches are vulnerable. Many of them were really hurt by COVID-19. And they're still recovering globally, still trying to catch up because they are vulnerable to shut down, to regulation, to whatever happens. Disciple-making movements are resilient. They're resilient. They continue. In fact, they thrive. They, they thrive. I remember reading about uh, Winners Chapel, a movement from Nigeria, that uh, one of the years during COVID-19, they planted 10,000 churches. As some people were trying to manage their service and to keep it going, their one service, the guys were planting 10,000 churches in one year. That's movements. That's a power of disciple-making movements. Uh, discipleship in regular churches is sermons or classes. But in disciple movements, it's discipleship is a way of life. It's not about come and sit down in a class. It's about now we walk the journey. Now I help, I help you become like me as I follow Jesus. It's about every aspect, not just the spiritual aspect. It's about how you do your business. It's about how you conduct your marriage. It's about how you parent your children. Discipleship is all-encompassing and nothing is safe or left out of discipleship. And then the last thing, regular churches are slow. They're very slow. They can't keep up with population growth. You know, we were trying to keep up with population growth. It's difficult because the population is growing fast in this part of the world. And I remember in our first, uh, I think, 17, uh, 18 years, we planted 30 churches. And I mean, we, were, we felt we were doing well for a church. I mean, 30 churches is not something to sneer at. It's not a joke. But the population was growing way faster than we were. And there were many more unchurch people when we, f when we finished than when we started. Yeah. Then we started learning how to become a movement. 
And last year alone, we planted 24 churches. In one year. Now, we're nowhere near where we need to be. We're still trying to learn how to become effective at this. But you know, only movements can hope to keep up with the growth of the population around them. So that's the difference. And so the question I want to ask, and maybe, and here's the thing, regular churches raise members. But disciple-making movements raise global missionaries. Yeah. There's nobody who walks into a disciple-making movement who is safe. This one is shy. They can just be an usher the rest of their life. Uh-uh. There's no such thinking. Anybody who comes in, we see a church planter, and we're going to send you one of these days. That's how, that's how disciple-making movements uh, think. What a shock. Yeah, yeah. You come in happily just, I'm coming to receive Pastor Jimmy's word. Pastor Jimmy is a, is a global leader here. You, you come to his church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an amazing leader. You come to his church saying, oh, I just want to receive a good message. You're in trouble. Because him is not just seeing a guy. He's seeing a church planter in you. And if you go to his church, there are many, any church planters from Pastor Jimmy's church in the house. I tell you, they're here. They're here. That's how disciple-making movements uh, operate. So how does a regular church become a disciple-making movement? How does a regular church become a disciple-making movement? I, I, this, this one I borrowed from Pastor Lincoln. Let me say, one of the things disciple-making movements do is they copy. They don't believe in being original. There's no time to be original. We just copy what we see working well. And so I copied this from Pastor Lincoln, and I think it's the most genius thing that I ever learned. Just put that up uh, before he sues me, and he knows I just, I've already given him credit. Uh, how does a regular church become a disciple-making movement? Five levels of engagement. The first is attendance. Think about the people in your church and ask yourself what level of engagement are they at. So the first level is attendance. Attendance has to do with blessing and inspiration. Uh, this person loves the music because you've got great music in your church. They love the preaching. They love Wonder Work. <laughs> They love the community. They love the size. Maybe some of them might even say, your church is just small enough for me. They want your church to stay small because it fits their needs. And they love it just the way it is. They love the various ministries. They meet all, you've got a great children's ministry for my kids and a great teens ministry for my teens. And it just meets all our needs. That's an attender. They are there because they are blessed and they are inspired. And let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with having attenders. In fact, it's a great achievement to move people from being complacent, not even interested in the gospel, to coming to a place where they're consuming from the church of God. It's a great thing. We need to applaud that when you bring people into church and you make them attenders. But many people understand, most churches in the world understand you can't stop there. People cannot die as attenders. God has more for them. And so many churches want to move people from consumers into a place where they're connected. They want to turn them into members. And that second step, membership. Membership has to do with belonging and contributing. When you're a member, you belong. This is home. You contribute. You're probably a, a part of a small group. You're connected with others. You don't just attend, but you're connected. You're in a group where you come every week and you share and you have support. Uh, you're also part of a church ministry, perhaps. You're even serving. You're an usher. You're in the worship team. You're in the children's ministry. You're an elder. You're, doing in a, you're in a place where you're now contributing to that church. And, and you regularly give and you tithe to the ministry. Uh, most members will say, this is my church. Because you belong to that church. This is your home church. And let me just say this. It's a fantastic thing to move people from attenders to members. Uh, we, part of the tool that, I, that we, we use here in Mavuno is called Mizizi. Uh, some of you call it Rooted. It's one of the best tools in the world to move people from being attenders to members. Yeah. It'll move you from being a place where you're just complacent, you don't know what church is about, to a place where you're like, I belong. And these are my people. Uh, it's a fantastic tool for that. And you know, for, the, for most churches, that's where we stop. But what if I told you that there's a much deeper place of engagement than just being a member? Are you ready to hear? The, sec the third step is family. Family is the third step of leadership. I even have a verse for this one. By the way, the other two don't have verses because they actually don't exist in the scripture. <laughs> Romans chapter 12 verse 45 is for just as each one 
us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. There's a certain level where you move from just being a place where this is my church, where you move into a place of identity and sonship. That's what family has to do with. At this point, you don't see church as a place that chosen to belong to. You understand, actually, I didn't choose it. God chose me for this family. It's like your biological family. You didn't choose your biological family. You didn't choose to be born in that family. You didn't choose your son name. You didn't choose the village of your birth. All these things were determined for you beforehand. By the time you're a family member of a church, you've understood, I didn't choose this church. God chose me for this church. And you understand, I'm here because I, I, I belong in this place. It's my identity. It's a spiritual family. Let me say something very interesting. And, and let me say, many people in the regular church are very threatened by this level of membership. Because it moves from the corporate church that we know into a much deeper level of belonging. And some of the re one of the things that causes people to be very scared of this is because they feel the pastor gets too much power. The, 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 the title we use in our, in our culture for these churches, it's a derogatory title. We call them daddy mummy churches. Where daddy is a pastor and mummy is the pastor's wife. And people say, I don't want to belong to a daddy mummy church. But I think what people don't understand is that the focus of a kingdom family church is not the father and the mother, the pastor and, the, and his wife. It's that everybody in the church is meant to be a daddy or a mummy to somebody else. It's like, a, it's like a natural family. Every single member is a son or a daughter and is also a father or a mother. The daddy mummy, do you belong to a daddy mummy church? Yes, because I'm a daddy. Yeah, so are you. So, so all of us are meant to be because the Bible didn't say, oh, pastors, go and make disciples of all nations. It didn't say that. It said to every follower of Jesus, you are one to make disciples. You make disciples of all nations. And so just like in a family, in a physical family, everyone understands that their role is to grow up and start their own family. There is no child who is born and aspires at 40 to still be breastfeeding from their mother. That is an unhealthy child. Yeah. I've been taken to school. They have done all this for me. and all, Now I just want to sit at home and just be coming and asking mommy to feed, to feed me. If you see that, you say that is not a healthy situation. Yeah, it's not. But you know, many Christians are content to be breastfeeding from the same church for 20 years, but they're not discipling anybody themselves. They're not leading anybody else in the faith. And they're content with that. And that's how regular churches think. And I think this level of family takes it to the place where we understand, I must be discipled and I must be discipling. That's what a family is. Thank you, Pastor Boni. Somebody likes my someone in this church. <laughs> Wow. So in a family, when your church is a family, the focus is on ensuring everybody is being discipled by somebody. And you should be able to say, who is my discipler? So let me ask you the question, who is your discipler? Number two, do they know it? Because you could be shouting yes and they look at you like, huh? When did I become? <laughs> yeah. And the next question you must ask in a family church is, who am I discipling? And do they know it? Because you could also be mentioning names and they look at you strangely like, when did you start discipling me? Yeah. It's about people. It's not about curriculum. Everybody is following somebody else as they follow Jesus. Let me say this. This is a powerful discovery. When you become family, your church becomes a joyful place. Let me tell you, your church becomes a happy place. Yeah, yeah. There are some happy churches in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, let me just tell you. Some, some people are on their best behavior today. These this worship harvest people, they're just pretending. <laughs> they're a family. And these guys love each other like crazy. And their church is a wild... I don't even know why they're so quiet today, Pastor Mo. Up Mo. Are they behaving? They're on their best behavior. It, or Kev the Rev intimidated them. Pastor Kev the Rev, what are you doing, Pastor Kev the Rev, to our visitors? Huh? Pastor Kev the Rev, why? <laughs> 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 Who is he? 
Yeah. By the way, let me tell you, Worship Harvest is a loving and joyful family. And anyone who attends that church loves being in that family. Oh, yeah. And then there's another church called Harvest Family Church. What? These ones can take over any place in Nairobi, by the way. Let me tell you, these guys, they have Pastor Jimmy's people. Pastor Jimmy and Pastor Marcy in the house, people, amazing leaders. Yeah. And their pastors and their sons and daughters. Let me tell you, when you go to their church, it's so noisy, you need earplugs. <laughs> like, like, they stay after church. They have an evening service that ends at nine. And then after the service, they hang out till midnight, just catching up. And the next day is Monday and they're all going to work. And they just love their church. Church is fun. Church is enjoyable. I love these guys. Their church is their life. And you know, it's interesting because we never used to be like that. But nowadays, you and Tamavuno Church. What? I, I'm, I'm not even hearing the Mavuno people. Where are they? Are they going to let me? Oh, they didn't get tickets. <laughs> oh, they didn't come. Oh, they're rioting. They're rejecting. <laughs> Mavuno family, are you in the house? Yeah. Let me tell you guys, Mavuno used to be a very dignified church until we understood family. Nowadays, we just let loose in the house of God. Because church is enjoyable. It's a fun place to be. We even sit on stage. Yeah. We, have, we come to church for four days in a row. From 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. Four days in February. Four working days. And these guys take leave and they just come and we hang out as a family. Somebody's going to be crazy. <laughs> family is fun. I mean, church just stops being a place you attend and you serve and you go back home. Church becomes my life. My church is my life. And we design leave days around church. By the way, in the, the beginning of the year, people tell me, give me the days we are supposed to be in church so I can plan my leave days. Yeah, that's family. God wants us to be in a family. Ask your neighbor, are you part of a family? Yeah, that's what God wants. Ah, please be seated. You're taking my time now. I need to, I need to finish. I need to finish. So the third level is what? Family. There's a fourth level. Family is not it. There's a fourth level. And the fourth level is army. That's the army. In army, army is, family is about identity and, and sonship, but army is about discipline and following. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 to 11 says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God. You know, you don't tell people to put on the full armor of God unless there's an enemy that wants to destroy them. Jesus Christ knows his church is going to be under assault. We're going to live in a volatile world that will want to destroy our faith. And so what does he do? He designs for us spiritual armor. And he puts us in a family that is designed to become an army. You know, you cannot win the war by being warm and fuzzy. You will be destroyed spiritually if all you think is about being warm and fuzzy. Because the enemies arrayed against you have spiritual weapons that are there. And many people think God will protect us. God is the one who protects us. But listen, the scriptures tell us, actually, we were the ones who are designed to have authority on this earth. That God designed us to have authority over the devil and his dominion. And that's why the Bible says that you will cry, he will bite your heel, but you will step on his head. Yeah, Angels are not the ones that will protect you from demons. You will protect yourself because God has given you authority. But for that to happen, you have to be an army. We've kind of read the scripture individualistically. So we've appropriated all the promises of scriptures as if they're for me. You know, we read Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper. And it's like God has said he knows the plans he has for me. No, he didn't write that word to an individual. He wrote it to a community. And 99% of the scripture promises are for a community. God's promises are heard when the community of God's people come together. And when we fight together, the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Not you as an individual, but the church of God. And so the next thing we have to do is build that, um, that family into an army. And let me just tell you this. Many people don't like this part. 
because many people don't like discipline. Isn't it? Yeah. But you have to understand, you're going to face opposition and the devil and his enemy are training against you every day. So you need to understand, the only way we're going to win this war is if we become an army. And it's instructive that Jesus teaches us that when we make disciples, the next step, and that's the part we don't usually do as a church, is to teach them to obey. Yeah. Teach them to obey. I didn't understand what that meant. Because I thought teaching them to obey is just telling them, preaching to them every Sunday. And telling them this is what God is saying. And then letting them go home. Until I understood, I would never do that to my own children. It would be criminally insane for me to just stand at home and say, Oh, it's not good for you to go out at night. It, you might get hurt. Oh, it's not good for you to eat chips every day. You might as well try and mix in some vegetables. Oh, this is what the Lord... Uh -uh. You see a parent doing that, you say, horrible parent. Yeah. What kind of parent would just stand there giving lectures to his children as the devil defeats them? You have to teach your children to obey. And obedience means that you say, uh uh, this is a no. None of us go in this direction. And of course, there's no child who likes being told no. Isn't it? Have you ever noticed the, the words the children struggle with? Johnny, say sorry. <laughs> why, why is it that they have that problem? Because they don't know how to obey, it's not natural to obey. And so Jesus says, teach them to obey. And that's what happens when you start to teach your people discipline. It means that you begin to teach them that, you know, prayer is not an option. It's a lifestyle. I remember when I had to teach my people to obey, I told them, you know what? In this church, we're going to wake up at 4.30 every morning and pray for an hour together as a church. Every single morning of the week. I told them, you can sleep on the weekends, but 4.30. I can tell you the kind of questions I got. Pastor M., are you crazy? 4.30. Why 4.30? Which scripture tells you 4.30? Where did Jesus pray at 4.30? But I'm a night person. For me, I go to work very early. You don't understand my lifestyle. I've been a Christian for 20 years and I've never prayed at 4.30. Why one hour? Let, oh my God. I had such a, like, because I'd never taught my people to obey. So it was a, was it a nightmare? Yeah. Then I told them, by the way, when we, when we pray online, you turn on your videos. We don't have anonymous people. And I say, when we start praying, you open your mic and everybody speaks. They almost killed me, by the way. <laughs> it's a miracle I'm still alive. But let me tell you something began to happen as these people began to obey. You know what began to happen? Miracles everywhere. In this church, over the last two years, we've had more miracles than we ever had the, the 18 years before that. Yeah. We've had crazy miracles happen. There's just something that happens when God's people all come together and they say, this is a voice we're following and we're going in one direction. The Bible says, if as one people speaking the same language, they begin to do one thing, nothing will be impossible. And that's why right now we're in a stage in Mavuno's existence where there's nothing impossible for us. There's nothing impossible because we're becoming an army. We're becoming an army. And I know that there are many churches here that are discovering this thing, by the way. It's not just Mavuno. There are many churches here that are discovering what it means to live in the age where nothing is impossible. But it takes an army for you to get there. Now, I need to do the last one. I wish, I wish this was a gathering. I'd have preached the whole day. But, but, but I, need to, I need to, Pastor Kuria is giving me that look of Pastor M. When are we finishing? Uh, okay, he said it. You heard him say it. <laughs> Number five. Because army is not it, but army is for a reason. And number five is the movement. Number five is where the movement begins to happen. And here we talk about Matthew 28. It's only as a movement that you can make disciples of all nations. If you are not content, if you're not willing to go through the discomfort of becoming a movement, guess what's going to happen? You're going to make disciples around your little village and around your little neighborhood and maybe plant a few churches like we had. But you're going to suffer managing those churches. It's only when you become a movement that you can actually obey the basic mission, the basic script of Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, which is fruitfulness and multiplication. That's what that scripture, that, that's what that space is. 
Let me tell you, movements multiply rapidly. They spread virally. They have multiple centers, and movements are hard to hijack. They're hard to hijack. Movements uh, are hard to hijack. Uh, it's very hard for someone to come and destroy it. Because you try to shut it down in one center, another center starts. You see what happens in the book of Acts. Uh, King Herod says, who's the leader of this thing? James. Kill him. Guess what happens next? Boom. Other people step up. And then now Peter comes up. And then he puts Peter in prison. And then Peter, God rescues him. But Peter has to flee. And then he, the, the Satan brings Saul to, to persecute the church. But guess what happens? Everywhere they go, churches are planted. You can't kill a movement. It's impossible to stop. And I believe, I mean, a movement is a virus. You're right. It's hard to exterminate. And let me tell you people, unless our churches are willing to become movements, they will be exterminated in this season. Because there's a shaking that is coming upon the world. And many of us are going to be left standing. You know, I, I've had people leave Mavuno and say, I can't stand this. I'm going, to, I'm going to find a regular church. And I tell them, I hope your regular church discovers this movement thing. Because otherwise you're going there to die. Yeah. And I say to them, chances are your regular church will come to this realization. Because I believe this is a global realization. It's not something that is just us. Other churches are beginning to realize this. And I say to them, you will go there. And 10 years from now, you will be doing what we are doing. And wondering why you wasted 10 years of your life. This is what's actually happening. That God wants his church to become a disciple-making movement. Now, I want to conclude. I want to conclude. <laughs> but I want to say this. Why is family? You notice that red thing. That's the tipping point. If your church is not a movement, that's the place you begin. You cannot do any of the rest without family. Without family, crazy things begin to happen. You try and make your people make disciples. Try and send them to foreign countries. Trust me, I tried. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You try and send missionaries out and they're not from a family. Guess what they'll be? Every conversation I had with my missionaries is, you don't understand how hard things are. You guys don't even care about us. Nobody cares about the fact that if it's very expensive out there. Who's going to pay our, you know, out, out of sight, out of mind. You can hear some of the missionaries already talking though are there. And all they had was just complaints, complaints. What have you done for me lately? That's what happens when you send out employees. But something changes when you send out sons. You know when you send out sons? Sons are out in the mission field and they're calling you and saying, how can I pray for you? What do you guys need? And they've got small churches out there in other countries, but they're like, how do we become part of what God is doing in this place? That's what sons do. We're in a season right now where it used to cost us a whole lot of money to plant churches. Last year, we planted 25 churches. How, what, how many did I say? 24 churches. You know, evangelists like me can add the number every time I mention. We planted 24 churches. And you know what the budget was? Zero shillings. Zero shillings. That's what happens when you have sons who are saying, I'm going to use my house to start this church. I'm going to use my office to start this church. I'm going to fund this thing. I'm going with the strength God has given me. Paul and Silas, they never asked people for money. They went. In fact, when they went, they sent money to Jerusalem. That's what happens when you send out your sons because they are the ones who are in love with what God is doing. And let me just say, when you don't have sons, you, you get rugged individualism. Everybody is thinking about themselves first. You get mission drift. And this happens a lot. The mission gets hijacked. The devil loves individualistic Christians. He loves Christians who think for themselves. He loves Christians who are just these independent cells that are not connected to the body. He loves those kinds of Christians. Because he knows how easy it is to isolate them and hijack them. That's what the devil loves. Now here's a discovery I made. Just go back, go to that map. The, 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 the next map. Uh, because it's a map that showed you. Here's a map I showed you about the global families, the places where there are movements. You know what I discovered in those places? About why those places are multiplying as rapidly as they are? I it was so strange for me to discover this. It's not because people are more prayerful in those countries. It's not because God dwells in those... At that time I used to ask God, are you Nigerian? Like, why is a church... Why is it that Nigerian churches just multiply? What, what is this? It's not because God has any partiality. The Bible says God has no partiality. You know what the reason is? It's because in those cultures, they have a very strong family ethos. 
in the secular culture. Yeah. In, those, in those cultures, they believe in family. And family is a thing you do. I remember one of my Nigerian friends trying to help me understand family from his context. And Pastor Kari and I were not getting it. Until he said, you don't understand. Let me tell you what a Nigerian mom does. If you mess up with your mother, I don't know if there are Nigerians in the house to testify. He said, if you mess up with a Nigerian mom and you are a university student, she will come to your university dorm, knock on your door, open it, grab your ear and pull you out all the way into the place where it's public, make you kneel down there and slap you. And nobody will bat a finger. In fact, people will be passing like, hey, that's the mother. She has every right to do that. Nigerian moms are no joke. Hashtag Nigerian moms. There's one in the house, I tell you. I mean, I'm not saying that that's, I'm just saying that they have a certain view of family that causes them when the church enters that culture, boom, because the gospel thrives when there's family. Now, our cultures, many of our East African cultures don't have a view of family. Many of our Western, for those of you who come from Western nations, they do not have a view of family. They are very individualistic. And that makes the church weak in those places. And so what do we do? We can't say our church will never grow because we're not Nigerians. No. There are things in our culture that must be condemned. And there are things that we come and say, this is not of the kingdom. And we must form a new culture in the kingdom of God. And that's what any church in this culture that wants to thrive and to become a kingdom movement is going to have to go against the culture. Some of my pastor friends from this culture sat down with me. And they said, Pastor M, we don't like the language of family. It's been abused in our culture. Mommy, daddy churches. We think Mavuno is a reputable church, but you're dragging your church into disrepute. You cannot have that conversation. You cannot call yourself a father or call your wife a mother. You cannot call people. You cannot use that family language. And I sat down with my friends and I said, let me explain to you. And I explained to them some of what I've, ex I've explained. And at the end they said, we get it. We understand. But could you do it without using the language. <laughs> so, so, so you know what I told them? I said, the cure for bad fathers is not no fathers. It's good fathers. Yeah. We, can't, we can't throw out a kingdom concept because the devil has tried to hijack it. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Our job is to take territory. We are taking it back. We are taking back the family. Yes, you may have come from a family that was broken, but God has put you in a spiritual family for healing and for wholeness. That's what God wants of us. And so family is so important for you. If you're not part of a family, you must be part of a family. And let me just say this as I conclude. The most important thing you can do in your church is create the culture, the culture of family for this thing we're talking about to grow. And the reason is because somebody once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good your vision statement is. It doesn't matter how good your mission statement is. It doesn't matter how encouraged and passionate you are about changing the world. If you don't have a family culture, your culture will eat your strategy for breakfast. And so I want to just say, can I, can I leave you with one last thing? By the way, I could teach on this for the whole day. But let me just leave you with one last thing. Give me that document that has the four parts. Uh, I want to teach you something I learned about global cultures. Maybe one of the fearless is I'll teach about this. But here's the thing. This, I call this the disciple shift. There are certain things we learn from the global church about discipleship. And then there are certain things we learn from the church in the West. And most of us, we're descendants of the Western church. That's a church that has defined global Christianity. So we need to see what are the things we can learn from the West, but what are the things that we must learn from where movements are happening globally. And these are the four things. From the Western church, we learn structures and we learn language. So let me explain that. Structures have to do with how to organize your community to help it multiply. And some of the Western churches have this down. They have language. Uh, discipleship group. We use what we call discipleship groups. Missional communities. Zones, campuses, networks, movements. This is how you organize your people in tens, in 30, in 50s, in hundreds, uh, in 500s, so that they can grow, so that the community is organized for discipleship. And every single person in the church is descended through discipleship to somebody else. Uh, this is structure. Language. Again, we can learn the language. Words or phrases that have a common understanding or common meaning in our church. Your church has to, every, every movement has to have language in common. 
And there's some great language we've learned from the Western church, things like uh, invitation and challenge, relationship triangle. I'm going to tell you where we get all that. There's a great book called uh, Building a Discipleship Culture by Mike Breen. And if you've read that book, it will teach you language and culture of movement. And I love that, you know, one of the things that the strength of the Western church is structure. Uh, they are able to just uh, uh, be able to understand something and put structure to it. I love that. But on the side, the global side, when I've looked at the other churches, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Nigeria, whether it's Ghana, whether it's Korea, you're going to find that, there are other, that the things that they bring is values and practices. And these ones are not in the Western church, or at least the church that we descended from. Uh, values have to do with the things that matter the most to us if we want to achieve our mission. And what are values? Values have to do with family, the things I've been talking about today. Sonship, loyalty, diligence, sacrifice. Some of the things that we use in that language that, that are very important. Uh, practices have to do with things we must regularly do to become who we have set out to be. Again, you're going to find global movements have practices that they do that everybody in the church does that are extremely important. Praying, preaching. I, I borrowed this from Apostle Mukesa, uh, the, the, the four Ps. Praying, preaching, pastoring, planting. Everybody in the church practices those things. There is no global movement that is growing where people don't all pray. Communion prayer is, you cannot do it. I remember we used to think we prayed until we learned how to pray. We, we met a man called Bishop Doug. Uh, from Ghana, one of the great movement leaders. I love him because he writes books. And he talks about, you know, Jesus to to told his disciples, could you not watch one hour? And Bishop Doug says, you know what? If you're a disciple, you have to pray at least one hour a day. That's his interpretation of that scripture. I thought, my God, I'm a pastor. I don't even think I pray one hour a day. And so we came as a church and we said, every disciple in this church must pray one hour a day, at least, because Jesus said it. And then he said, if you're a pastor, because Jesus prayed three times, he told them that three times, a pastor play, prays at least three hours a day. Oh, God help us. Any pastors in the house? <laughs> so, so these practices, you're going to find them in every Korean churches. They pray like crazy and they pray every day. And so we had to bring these practices into our church and we began to see the fruit of these practices and the book that I wanted to 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 mention there it's a great book by again by an American author uh, it's called he's called Chris Galanos and it's called from mega church to multiplication the reason I refer I mean Bishop Doug has many many good books that I've read but I also suspect that you probably need to be leading something to understand Bishop Doug if you're not leading anything and you read it he will offend you <laughs> if, you're, if you're just a spectator coming to read his books, you will not understand anything. Once you start leading, then start reading him. But before that, Chris Galanos from Mega Church to Multiplication. It's an American mega church that decided to become a global movement, a disciple making movement. And I love how he simply breaks it down uh, about this. So here are some good resources for you. Some results of the culture shift. I'm going to end with this tangible love and joy. When you begin to enter this culture shift, your church will become a joyous place. You will enjoy church. People will actually enjoy being part of that family. Another thing that's going to happen, you're going to have a lot of great, a lot of ownership and sacrifice. People will give their own resources in ways that are incredible and unimaginable. It's interesting. We just discovered this a couple of months ago. Uh, we our giving last year, the year, the first real year after COVID, uh, was actually higher than our pre-COVID giving as a church. Where many churches globally are expanding, are, are, are recovering from COVID, our giving has actually grown since COVID. And it's growing every year. Why? Because people are becoming sons of the house. And they, when you're a son, you give. You love what you do. You give radically. And I think we're still on that journey, but I can see the ownership increasing. Uh, spiritual growth. People start to grow. I can tell you there are people in Mavuno Church who never pray 10 minutes a day. Nowadays, they are prayer warriors. One hour is not enough for them. They are praying like, I mean, there are people making prayer covenants in this church and just praying, and they're seeing cancer being healed in their families. And, they're, and you look at them and you're saying, the other day you were just a nice Instagram beautiful girl. How is it that now you are, you're, you're, you're chasing demons? Come on, somebody. There is growth in the house of God when people begin to understand who they are as a farm, in their identity. Signs and wonders. 
signs and wonders. We experience signs and wonders almost every time we gather as a family, uh, when we gather together as a movement. And you start to experience those signs and wonders in your church as well. And then viral growth. You're going to start to see multiplication like you've never seen before. There's someone here who has a glandular issue. You, 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 you find that your, your glands are out of balance and you're not able to, to control them. There's just something glandular. I want to pronounce over you that God is healing you right now in Jesus' name. Yeah. You know what? You just accept the healing. Don't worry. Because you will testify before fearless is over. Yeah. Somebody here has been struggling with hot flashes. <laughs> you've just been, you've just been, you can't even sleep because your body just cannot control its own temperature. Jesus is healing you right now in Jesus' name. Yeah. In Jesus' name. You know what happens when you become a movement, you start to actually see what happened in the book of Acts. That God has given us authority over even the things that happen here on earth. And I want to just speak a blessing over us right now. Father, I thank you for your sons and daughters. I thank you that, Lord, you're not content to leave any of us as an individualistic little Christian. You're not content for any of us to live a mediocre life. You're not content for any of us to just live and, 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 and get married and go to school and have children and then die. That, Lord, you came that we would make, would do greater things than Jesus himself did. Thank you that your word, you tell your disciples, you will do greater things than I have done because I'm going to be with the Father. I thank you because that is the destiny of everybody who is here today. That, Lord, every single one of us is going to become a world changer. Your word says that the smallest of you, one of you will put a thousand to flight. I declare over you fearless that every one of you, the least influence you'll have is eternity, eternal influence on a thousand people. Every single one of you, that is God's plan for you. And every one of you, God has created you to make a difference across the world. And Father, I just pray for anyone here who has heard your word. Maybe today something has just locked into place. You've understood your church better. You've understood the gospel better. I pray that, Father God, a new sense of joy is about to be released in your sons and daughters' life. There's someone here who's been struggling. You've been struggling to be a disciple. But today you understand it for the first time. I declare joy over you in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I bless you. I honor you. I look forward in anticipation to what you're going to do the rest of this fearless summit. We bless you, our God and King, for we pray all these things in the mighty and matchless name of the Lord and Savior Jesus and God's people said, Amen.